Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the dwelling place. You see that I'm smiling today. That's because it takes about three or four different starts in order to get going. I don't know why that I get my words mixed up or I just, you know, I do a weird introduction here. But uh, anyway, this is the third take and I uh, just wanted to uh, spend some time with you today. Here we are in the kitchen in the heart of our home and I'm um, just going to share, you know, a, a a biblical truth here today and uh, a little bit of an object lesson story that uh, that I hope that kind of drives it home and gives you something to uh, think about this week because that's my goal is that we would um, take spiritual truth from the Word of God we would directly apply it to our life and that we would walk it out this week and uh, I'm gonna read to you something that uh, that I read a little while back and in, in my devotion and and my devotion book is one of the uh, the Lectio Divina it's called is which is the study of read think, pray, and live. And so what it gives you an opportunity to, to read out just a small portion of scripture. <laughs> uh, and really then you, to take the time to think about it, you know, and to, to write out what, what do you think about this? What does this passage of scripture we just read mean to you? Uh, and then put it into a prayer. So then turning that, that scripture into a prayer going, God, what I just read here, I pray that this would become a part of my life. And, um, uh, and the last part is live, you know, so then you shift to that part and write out, uh, okay, so I'm, how am I going to live this out? Because it's one thing to think about it and another thing to pray, but it's another altogether to say, okay, this is where I'm going to put feet to my faith. This is where I'm actually going to walk this out this week. This is what it means to live it out. And you write that out as well. And so I've been really enjoying this this year. So anyway, um, let me read to you this passage of scripture. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. So if you have your Bible, turn there and uh, follow uh, with me if you'd like. I'm going to be reading from the Message Translation. It says this, I know that I distressed you greatly with my letter. This is Paul writing to the Corinthian church. And although I felt awful at the time, I don't feel bad at all now seeing how it turned out. The letter upset you, but only for a while. Now I'm glad. Not that you were upset, but that you were jarred into turning things around. You let the distress bring you to God, not to drive you from him. The result was all gain and no loss. Distress that drives us to God does that. It turns us around. It gets us back in the way of salvation. And we never regret that kind of pain. But those who let their distress drive them away from God are full of regrets and end up on a deathbed of regrets. That passage just jumped out at me and I just was thinking about this and, and I read it, you know, probably two or three weeks back and I just kept circling back to it again. That wording there, the distress that drives us to God. What is distress that drives us to God? And I want to look at that a little bit today because, you know what, I, I think, you know, in, in several different translations in the, in the NIV, it says godly sorrow brings repentance that leaves leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Uh, in the, uh, the ESV version, it says, for godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation. In the Amplified Bible, it unpackages that even deeper. Listen to this. For godly grief and the pain that God is permitted to direct produce a repentance that leads to and contributes to salvation and deliverance from evil. And it never brings regret, but worldly grief, the hopeless sorrow that is characteristic of the pagan world, is deadly, breeding and ending up in death. Distress, grief, sorrow, and pain. You probably are thinking right now, maybe I should have, you know, tuned into Elevation or, you know, I, I should have tuned in and, you know, watched the, you know, Sweets Corners Church or Kingsway or something like that. They probably have something more upbeat. But, you know, I, I want to look at this a little bit because I think there's something that we need to, uh, to understand that suffering or loss or disappointment or grief or sorrow or pain are part of the things of this life. And it's unavoidable if we live in this life then there is going to be loss, disappointment, sorrow, and pain. But how we respond to it, we, that's maybe unavoidable, but how we respond to it is so key and so important. So not only in this passage, but in many passages of Scripture, God encourages us in the midst of these things to let them shape us, to let them bring us to God. It's like I, we read in the message there is that, you know, the, the, the sorrow that drives us 
back to God. And I want to look at that because, you know, we all handle adversity or challenges in different ways, but God's desire really would be is that in each adverse circumstance or disappointment or struggle, that it would bring us, you know, as the, as the old time saints would say, bring us to our knees, bring us to a place of drawing closer to God, even if we don't understand and can't comprehend or are frustrated with what's going on, is this, this uh, situation actually brings us to a place of drawing closer to God. So what does sorrow or grief mean? Sorrow or grief, or grief is a feeling of deep distress caused by loss, disappointment, or other misfortune suffered by oneself or others. So let me ask you this question this morning. Have you ever suffered any of the following? Number one, loss. Yes. Disappointment. Yes, again. <laughs> Misfortune. Absolutely. But the truth is this, is that suffering is not easy. I mean, no one runs to suffering, do we? It's not something that, you know, that that we, you know, look forward to is like, oh, I hope this week, you know what I'm really hoping this week, I hope I have some deep suffering happens or, you know, some struggles come my way because I'm just looking for an opportunity to grow. You know, honestly, is that when we get in suffering, uh, my immediate response and probably yours and most people is, is I was like, how do I get out of this as quick as possible? If I'm stuck in this, then what is the quickest way of because suffering is not comfortable. It is not, you know, uh, you know, a, a, a peaceful place, you know, but but that's kind of the point. Suffering is not easy. And the point is that it's difficult because in difficult situations, we really and truly grow. If we think about in our life is the deepest, deepest growth that happens usually in times when we have to persevere, in times when we have to press in to God. We grow spiritually, you know, in times of challenge. When, when you know, when, when let's say someone, a loved one close to us is going through a terminal you know, uh, disease or going through uh, medical treatment or we've lost someone close to us, you know, or you're, there's different you know, challenges that, that, that bring us to a place where we search. Maybe what brought you to God in the first place, you know, is deep personal loss. Whether your company that you built and, and established that was everything you had went bankrupt or your business partner left or, you know, your marriage, you know, your relationship came apart and unraveled. That sometimes in the midst of great loss is that brings us to a place to come to God. To suffer is to be challenged on some level. You see, if we look at it, there are people that, uh, some people suffer more than others. And whether their suffering is physical, spiritual, emotional, or psychological, the purpose of suffering should be seen as an opportunity for growth. And I ran across this story, I thought it was really good. There was once uh, upon a time, there was a daughter that complained to her father that her life was miserable and she didn't know how she was gonna make it. She was tired of fighting and struggling all the time. I don't know if you've ever had this conversation with your kids or grandkids before, but they're just tired of the struggle. It seemed as just as one problem was solved, another soon followed. And so her father's response was simply this, as he took her to the kitchen and he filled three pots with water. Then he put the pots on the fire. And he began to boil them. In the first pot, he placed a potato. In the second pot of water to boil, he placed an egg. And in the third pot that was to boil, he took ground up coffee beans and poured that in. Now he took a few minutes to let things boil, about 20 minutes, and the daughter groused and complained, you know, what is this all about? Dad, just tell me what this is all about. Come on, I don't have all day here. And you know, the, the drama that you get, the rolling of eyes. But then she finally, after they finished, the daughter asked what this was all about. So the father took, and after everything was boiled, and we're not going to wait for these to boil, but you know, when they had all boiled, he took them off the stove, placed them into a bowl. He took out the potato and put it in a bowl. He took the egg out, put it on the same plate, and he took the coffee and poured it into a cup. 
And he turned to the daughter and he said, daughter, what do you see? And she goes, with a big rolling of her eyes, you know, the big dramatic roll, potatoes, eggs, and coffee, she said. Look closer, he said, and touch the potatoes. So she put her hand into the bowl and started to press on the potato, and she did, and she noted that the potatoes were soft. Then he asked her to take the egg that had boiled in the water and break it. And after pulling off the shell, she observed the hard-boiled egg. Finally, he asked her to sip the coffee. Its rich aroma brought a smile to her face. And she asked him, Father, what does this mean? Then he explained that the potatoes, the eggs, and the coffee beans had each faced the same adversity of the boiling water, but each one reacted differently. The potato went in strong and hard and unrelenting, but in boiling water it became soft and weak. The egg was fragile and the thin outer shell protected the liquid interior until it was put in the boiling water. Then the inside of the egg became hard. However, the ground coffee beans were unique. After they were exposed to the boiling water, they became something new. Which one are you? He asked the daughter. When adversity knocks on your door, how will you respond? Are you a potato, an egg, or a coffee bean? See, the moral of the story is simply this, is that things happen around us and to us, but the only thing that truly matters is how that we choose to react to these things and how that we, uh, how do we make out of it. Life is all about learning and adopting and converting all the struggles that we experience. Another story is one out of the Bible, and I'll just turn this off before I set the back of my shirt on fire, leaning against the stove. Another example from the Old Testament is from a small book called Ruth. And the book of Ruth is just near the beginning. Joshua judges Ruth, you know, the beginning of the Old Testament there. And it's a story of um, a nice Jewish family that had a problem. They lived in Bethlehem, but famine had hit Bethlehem, and that forced Elam, uh, Elam Melech and his wife, Naomi, to move east to Moab with their two sons to find food to survive. Once they had moved there and found food, they set up shop, and they began to live there. Actually, they lived there for almost 10 years. After living and, 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 and moving to this foreign place there, the sons actually married two local girls, Ruth and Orpah. And during this time, life was good, or so it seemed. But as the story reads on, one by one, tragically, one after another, Elamelech and his two sons die. All three of the men perish, one after another. And this leaves Naomi, Ruth, and Orpah without husbands, without supply, without a provider, and in desperate need of help. Naomi decides at this time to head back to Bethlehem. Ten years is a long time to be gone from her hometown. And so she packs her belongings, and her daughter-in-laws pack their belongings to join her. But Naomi begs the girls to stay behind, and while Orpah is convinced, and goes back to Moab, Ruth pledges her devotion to Naomi, her mother-in-law, forsaking her God, forsaking her people to become part, part of Naomi's life, Naomi's people, and Naomi's God. And Ruth's stubbornness pays off, and, and Naomi lets her come with her. But as they return to Bethlehem, as they return to their, to their homeland again, it's a struggle doesn't end. Naomi actually even changes her name as people said, this is Naomi, welcome back again. She says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, which means bitter. She was struggling. She was struggling with the loss of her husband. She was struggling with the loss of her sons to the point where she changed her name to just call me bitter. I think that described where she was totally at in every point of her life. But as they lived there for a while, Eventually, Ruth meets a man named Boaz. And after a little bit of social engineering, read the mother-in-law matchmaking, a bit of drama and some tricky land and family negotiations, Ruth and Boaz get married. Soon, Ruth and Boaz have a son, which makes Naomi very happy. 
The women in the town named the baby Obed, and surprise, surprise, he goes on to be the grandfather of King David. Talk about a happy ending. You see, the part of the story is, for the majority of the story, almost all of it, 80% of the story, is a story of struggle, a loss, grief, disappointment, sorrow, probably a lot of hand-wringing and, and, and looking up at the sky and talking to God and saying, God, what is going on here? We don't understand. Why, why did we have this you know, famine? Why did we move here? Why did, my, you know, why did our, our loved ones die? Where, you know, where is our provision? And, and, and they moved and pulled up roots and moved again. And, and, and uh, there's a lot of struggle and adversity in the story. But the power of the story is, is that you continue to read on to the end that as they persevere, that as Ruth leaves everything, leaves all of her, uh, her, her hometown and, and joins and accepts God as her savior and as her provider, that she meets Boaz, that she actually comes into the lineage of King David, that she comes into the lineage of the Messiah, a foreign woman, someone who has immigrated to a new country, a new language, a new God, a new customs, someone who had known much adversity and struggle. And I want to, and I think that God placed these stories in the Bible so that we could relate, so that we could see that when, when we have challenges that happen in our life, and maybe you're not in that place of challenge and adversity right now, then we'll prepare this, but just talk this away for when you will be. And if you have, and, and maybe you're like Naomi, you know, that you've gone through it, but you're just at a place going, just don't call me Naomi, call me bitter. Call me Mara. And there's a deep bitterness and regret and disappointment that I want to encourage you today. God wants to speak into your life to tell you that your story is not yet over. That as we follow along, that as we let God's character transformation happen in our life is that he has great endings to tough beginnings. The question for that I have for you today is this. Is do, does your sorrow or your struggles bring you down or drive you closer to God. In the song in the David Crowder band, a song called he, How He Loves Us, the verse reads this, one line. It says, all of a sudden, I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory. And I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. See, Paul also writes to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians 1, 7. It says, we are confident that as you share in our suffering, you will also share in the comfort that God gives us. You see, the original passage that we began to read out of my devotion book in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 is not yet over. Can we read on? Let's take it and read further here. We've left off on verse 11 to 13, but let's read on here. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 13, and says this, And now... Isn't it wonderful all the ways in which this distress has goaded you closer to God? You are more alive. You are more concerned, more sensitive, more reverent, more human, more passionate, more responsible. Looked at from any angle, you've come out of this with purity of heart. And this is what I was hoping for you in the first place when I wrote this letter. On the other side of adversity, on the other side of sorrow or grief or disappointment is more. Is this more alive, more concerned, more sensitive, more reverent, more human, more passionate, more responsible. And also that you come out of this with a purity of heart. I'm not saying that God causes every bit of distress in your life. I don't think that God operates this way. Going, I'm just going to sprinkle. Things are going too good, you know, for you over there. Just you're doing great over there, and I'm just going to sprinkle a little bit of adversity because I don't want you to get too comfortable. I think just living in this life, living in a broken world, living, you know, in, in a world of sin where people are selfish, and that where you know, and, and you know. And governments do self-interested things and, and there's corruption and, and, and all of this around us is that there is distress, there is pressure, there's disappointment that comes in this. But on the other side, as we walk through this, and there's seasons, and, and as we when we pass through this, is that on the other side is this more sensitive, more alive, 
more alive, more human. I was reading about St. Uh, Teresa of Lisieux, and she said this, her quote, I just read it, said, I had to pass through many trials before reaching the haven of peace, before tasting the delicious fruits of perfect love and of complete abandonment to God's will. She says, first I had to pass through many trials before reaching this haven of peace. You see, her story is that at the age of 14 is that she had a dramatic conversion experience that transformed her life. And from then on, her, her powerful energy and sensitive spirit were turned towards love instead of keeping herself busy or making herself happy. And at 15, she entered a Carmelite uh, a convent in Lisieux to give her whole life to God. She took the religious name of Sister Teresa of the Child Jesus and the Holy Face. She lived a hidden, simple life of prayer and was gifted with a great intimacy with God. And through sickness and dark nights of doubt and fear, she remained faithful to God, rooted in his merciful love. And after a long struggle of tuberculosis, she died on September 30th, 1897, at the age of 24. Her last words were the story of her life. My God, I love you. The world came to know St. Teresa through her autobiography, which is called Story of a Soul. She described her life as a little way of spiritual childhood. She lived each day with an unshakable confidence in God's love. What matters in life, she said, is not great deeds, but great love. She considers her, considered herself God's little flower. So in closing today, this would be my challenge. That's something for you to think about this week. Will you let your griefs, disappointments, and loss bring you closer to God? I know that people have a lot of discussions about what's going on right now and, you know, and, and, and further lockdowns going into the summer and what we've lost and our freedom and, and disappointment and, and people's lives are full, full of disappointment and loss, loss of summer, loss of freedom, loss, loss of sports, loss of school. And I don't have answers for those things and I don't pretend to have answers for these things. And this is not just going to be a political diatribe of me, you know, just <laughs> giving answers and, and, and introspection on, on government decisions. It's not about any of that. What really matters in this life is, does this bring me closer to God? That's my question in everything. Through every loss, through every disappointment, through every sorrow, through every grief, does this bring me closer to God? Let me close today with the words of Jesus. John 16, verse 33. It's near the end of his life and his ministry and his encouragement to his disciples, to his people, to the children of God. It says this, I have told you these things so that in me you will have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Heavenly Father, I just pray for every person today who comes with a heart full of disappointment, who comes that is just, just maybe just struggling just a little bit, that are just tired, that are just done. And I pray that you would encourage them further. You would encourage them to not give up, to not lose hope, to not lose that sense of peace inside of them. Jesus, you have overcome the world. We pray that this would draw us closer to you, that this would, even in the midst of, uh, not knowing the future and timing of things and, and where we are going next from here to make even plans is difficult. But God, we trust in you. We don't lose confidence and hope in you. Lord Jesus, help us to overcome. Let this draw us closer to you. Heavenly Father, just pray for each person in their struggle, in their grief, in their sorrow, that would bring this to you. We would bring this to you, Lord and let it draw us closer to you because out of the other side of it comes a purity of heart and more life, more passion, more sensitivity. Thank you, Father, for these things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. God bless you. I just want to let you know I'm praying for you this week. Whenever your, your name, your face comes before me, I just 
take that as an indication and urging from God to pray for you. And I know that other people are praying for you, so don't ever think that you are alone. People are praying for you. Jesus is on the right hand of the Father, interceding for you day and night, the Bible says. God bless you. Have an amazing week.